feudal Japan, a samurai was, was meant to protect a, a master. And, and if, in fact, that master were to, were to die by, by ill-gotten means, then that samurai would, would have lost his sword and wandered the countryside as a gun for hire. These are the Cinerama cameras of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, about to attempt one of the most challenging feats in motion picture history. <laughs> Guiding this multi-million dollar production, the sensational young director, John Frankenheimer. 16 specially designed and mounted Super Panavision Cinerama cameras are ready to record what is about to happen. In 1966, Monaco was the location for one of the most elaborate race car movies ever made, the MGM classic Grand Prix. Because of his passion for the sport, the young American director insisted no special effects shots would be used. Instead, all the car action would be shot for real. The film was rewarded with several Oscars and perpetuated Frankenheimer's reputation as one of the world's leading action directors. Winter 1998 and Frankenheimer is back on familiar ground. Fast cars on the French Riviera. With films like Grand Prix and his 1962 masterpiece The Manchurian Candidate firmly under his belt, he's one of the few directors qualified to shoot MGM's new fast lane thriller, Ronin. Well, I thought I could do it, and I thought I could do it rather well. It seemed to fit into things that I know how to do. I hadn't met him, and I didn't know what he was like. I had an impression that he was like maybe an older style kind of certain type of director that was a rigid in certain ways, and I didn't know whether it would be. When I met him, I saw he was a smart guy, and he had full intentions of making it a lot better than what we had there. <laughs> He's a real director, just when you're a kid, as you imagine what a film director is, John is it. You know, he's got the voice, he's got the presence, he's got the level of concentration. is just extraordinary. Here's what has to happen. He likes very much actors, and he knows exactly how you function. He knows how to direct you. He knows exactly what he wants. Hold it, stop. The subject matter lent itself to assembling an international cast. The subject is really a group of ex-intelligence people that are recruited to do this task. And they come from different nationalities. I mean, there is a Frenchman, there is a German, there is an Irish woman that recruits them. This is what we're after. We need to take it intact from several men who will be intent on preventing us. How many men? You American? I think the group would be quite small, between five and eight, no more than eight. They would think. You don't know for sure. I don't know now, but I will know before the event. If you don't know, why do you say between five and eight? Because there's two to three cars. The group's traveling. They're not in Paris? No. Where are they? You'll find out soon enough. What's in the case? Our plan, in the broad strokes, is an ambush. Several cars, I like that. Most of the time, production doesn't like you to drive because uh, <laughs> if something happened. But it's easy, and I did it and, uh, yes, as much as I can. <laughs> John's directions were very point blank. He said, uh, you don't win any points by smashing this thing into a wall. And he said, uh, and I don't want to see those brake lights. It's coming from the right. Is yours. As tricky as any stunt, I think, is the one outside the cafe. Good stunt. Well done. Thank you. Every stunt person have got their job and they know exactly what they're going to do. Uh, the main thing is when a car's coming at you like that is that you get your feet off the floor so that. Uh, 
you're not static, because if something hits you when you're static, you're going to get very badly hurt. So what we, we, we decided to do, the certain, two certain guys said, right, I'll get up on the hood of the car. And as you saw, they did. The idea of being able to work with Bob De Niro, who in my opinion is one of the finest actors that has ever, ever made movies, was a privilege. And uh, he was perfect for what I wanted as Sam and what Frank wanted as Sam. And we went out of our way to try and convince him to do it, and I'm so glad we did. What's in the case? That information is necessary. Is it heavy? Is it explosive? Is it chained to some unlucky bloke's wrist? We're going to have to chop it off? I All mean, right. What is it? But I'm not under any obligation to let you know. If you are not, then the price has got to go up. I'll get you the case, but the price has got to go up. If it's going to be amateur night, I want $100,000. I want it up front. I want it in a bank account. I want another 100000 when you get the case. He is a, a guy who's, um, and I've met people like this. They're very no-nonsense. they got a sense of humor because they're in a very grim profession in the sense that they, do, they take risks that other people don't. Who and how many are going to be coming after us? You worried about saving your own skin? Yeah, I am. It covers my body. You got to be clear about what you're doing. You can't, little, any little mess up can cost somebody or him his life. So he wants to do it and get out. OK. You aren't going in there. Yeah, I'm going in there. So are you. Why am I going in there? Why, to protect me. There is no protection there. Come on, we're fishing a barrel. What are you doing? Why do they want you in there? What are you, crazy? You know, you think so hard. Nobody ever told me that before. But I wouldn't go in there. What is it, sir? I don't like it. Look at it. Okay, okay. Okay, let's just do it. Let's just do it and be done, yeah? You don't want to go in there. I'm getting paid to go. It's that simple. They're lonely. That was uh, the first. Uh, idea I had in my mind when I, I read the script. And then I will, I will find the relationship with the, the Niro's character, Sam. You labor or management? If I was management, I wouldn't have given you a cigarette. It's a very strange relationship, not really written. It's something in between that I like. I didn't, I didn't do a movie like that before. You know. Spence, who is British, probably ex-military, and uh, he's found himself in the company of these, these people that have also been hired, and uh, he's a little bit out of his depth. Uh, he's got quite a, an overinflated opinion of himself. Uh, he thinks he's much more experienced than he actually is. Because of his incompetence, he's quite a dangerous character to himself and everybody else. Two shooters. Car comes through here. Shooters across from each other, kill each other dead. Oh, my. Where'd you learn that? Huh? In a regiment. What regiment was that? The 22nd Special Air Service. What's the color of the boathouse at Hereford? What's the color of the boathouse at Hereford? I don't like your attitude. The... Oh, you got the gun. I'm on arm. Do something. Go ahead. Do something. Do something. Do something. <laughs> Tell me about an ambush. Tell me about an ambush. I ambushed you in a cup of coffee. You'll get your money when we get the kiss. Yeah. The others, too. That is what I understood. Come on, we've gotten the word. We're moving. I haven't, as yet, had an opportunity to play a sort of proactive character who, you know, is one of the protagonists, isn't a supporter to a protagonist, isn't a woman to, to a man, rather than just someone in her own right. And it's rarely alluded to the fact that I'm female. I just am, and I happen to have the job that I have. And I and the one who's attempting to lead this mission. So, that, you know, it's great. It's exciting to play a part where, um, where you drive the action. Russians are trying to bid for the case. The case is in Nice. They're trying to sell it to the Russians. They're staying at the Villa Belmer in Nice. The team isn't ready. Whatever the team is, you do it now. 
Russians have decided to bed. We need to move now. Excuse me. He's called Seamus. Um, and uh, he is the person who's brought together all the, the different um, organizations and different sort of mercenary figures in a group in order to do this job. But they don't know, they've never met him, they don't meet him. Uh, so they don't know that he's, he's in charge as well. He's a help! He's a My idea of this guy is working as a spy hardened him and destroyed him partly. And he had a family, a wife and a son, and they left him and he was not allowed to meet his son. And by the time he enters this film, he, uh, he is quite suicidal and cold. This story is, of course, not in the movie. In the movie, I'm mostly just cold-eyed. See that little girl down there? Have you lost your mind? Why did you do that? I don't particularly like you. Just imagine what I'll do to you if you try anything. Now give me my money. On location in Paris, Burt Lancaster and director John Frankenheimer check preparations for the biggest explosion ever staged for a motion picture. A 30-car ammunition train will be blown sky high for the adventure drama The Train. A battery of nine cameras in steel and concrete bunkers is rigged for remote control. No one will be allowed in the blast area where temperatures are going to soar to 400 degrees. The countdown has begun. Shooting films like The Train and the Gene Hackman thriller French Connection 2 have secured the country of France a place in Frankenheimer's heart. He now considers it his second home. I suppose if someone loved Italy, you could take this story and do the whole thing in Rome. I suppose you could do it in Berlin. I suppose you could do it in Madrid. I would not have been able to do the film nearly as well anywhere else as I could do it in Paris. Because number one, I know Paris. And number two, I think I, for a foreigner, I think I understand France very well. And I think I was able to use a lot of the things I know about France and put them in this movie. It, it really is very different here. For example, the mayor's office and the police are not connected. And where in America they really are, if you get the mayor to say, okay, you can go and do something, then the city sort of opens up for you and, and, and every courtesy is given to you. Here, the mayor could say, we're happy to have you and we think it's wonderful that you're here. And if the police don't want you doing what you want to do, the mayor doesn't matter. Shock waves have carried to the Arch of Triumph in the heart of Paris. Debris is scattered over 50 acres. Windows are broken in a two mile radius. Here is the shattered star of the movie's biggest explosion. When it cools down, the train will resume shooting on schedule. With some experience in the field, Frankenheimer rose to the formidable challenge of shooting in Paris. We have a car chase that goes right through Paris, all of Paris. The cars are going through Paris streets at over 100 miles an hour, and that's unheard of. Another sniper is on top of this bridge. Fires a shot, just misses, Sam returns, the guy falls. Long before anyone got behind a steering wheel, the stunt coordinators had to plot every single move using exact models of the locations. Several different versions of each car were built, allowing the actors to ride in the cars during the chase sequences. We have a professional drivers uh, driving, I guess, British-made cars. We have these phony uh, fakes the steering wheels on the left, so it looks like we're driving. replica of the Audi, completely built from scratch to look exactly like uh, the, the actual car. The special thing that it has to offer is that uh, it's actually going to be a stunt car driver sitting in the trunk of the car who's driving the car. They have a box that they put over the pedals so my feet can't actually uh, go to the brake or the gas just in case I panic. <laughs> it doesn't give you confidence when you have somebody driving in your back. <laughs> I prefer to drive myself, <laughs> of course. An elite group of drivers was assembled to tackle the breathtaking stunt work required for the film, headed up by race driver Jean-Claude Lannier. J'ai gagné les, les 24 heures du Mans, 1997, en Porsche GT2. 
et la personne qui double euh, Deirdre était avec moi dans la voiture. Et en plus, nous avons, euh, nous avons pris Jean-Pierre Jarrier pour doubler Bob, l'ancien pilote de Formule 1. Le stuff dans les tunnels à Paris était un peu peur, mais le stunt driver était vraiment terrifique. À la fin de la dramatique Paris chase sequence, this BMW needs to roll onto its roof and slide off the bridge. Natasha McElhone's stunt double, Michel Neugarten, checks every part of the apparatus before he's ready to do the stunt. You can control it as, uh, as much as possible, obviously. Uh, there's always the element of risk, otherwise they wouldn't use stuntmen. The car has righted itself instead of remaining on its roof. The stunt will take hours to reset. Another car will need to be prepared. Director John Frankenheimer is reluctant to redo such a dangerous stunt. After watching it again on his monitor, he's convinced he can make it work at the editing stage. Stop! Okay, now you're inside the car. You know, you're inside the car. And you're, in, you're on to De Niro in the other car. John shot sparingly, doesn't do a lot of takes. You can't do a lot of takes with that stuff. You got to get it right once with a few cameras. When you do big stunts, you know, they never go the way you think that they're going to go. They're always longer than you think that they're going to be. There's always problems that sort of manifest themselves. And there's in this constant balancing act that you play between doing it quickly, doing it efficiently, and doing it safely. Audiences are not used to seeing films like this made in France. They're used to seeing films like this made in New York or Chicago or Los Angeles. We really see France as a background for a big action movie, and I think that's quite extraordinary. What's in a case? Something we're paying you for. Psychology, romanticism, violence, car chases. Interesting. Different. So how'd you get started in this business? A wealthy scoundrel seduced and betrayed me. Same with me. How about that? There's elements of past eras of films in, in this movie, or at least that's the way it looks on the, on the monitor. And I remember seeing it because all my monitor's black and white, and just thinking, God, this would be so great if it was in black and white, because many of John Frankenheimer's movies, obviously, were, were black and white movies, and it's a medium that he really, really knows how to work in. Just a, a real sense of style. Gosh. And there are more subtle things in this that I am hoping will be able to be understood in the script when John puts it all together. Let's just hope the movie is, works and is good and well received. That's all you can hope for. Anytime you decide to take on a movie as a director, it's a tremendous challenge and you have tremendous problems and you are under great tension and under great uh, stress. This movie has been less stressful than most movies because first of all, we had a wonderful script. We had a wonderful cast. So really the only thing I had to do was go out and do what I'm paid to do, which is to do my job. And as far as uh, filming on location is concerned, I've been doing that for more years than I would care to say. And as far as shooting all the car stuff for real, that's what I've done. And this was a movie that, now that it's over, really went quite smoothly. <laughs> in the case. 